Hello, and welcome to Resonances. Um, it's the third year in a row that the Great Works program of Baruch College has collaborated with the Penrill Voices Festival to bring you um, some absolutely extraordinary writers from across the globe. I, I see a lot of familiar faces from Resonances events in past years, um, so you all know that uh, the dimensions of this program are as follows. Each of these five writers has been asked to choose a classic work. Um, they've been supplied with a list of works actually being studied this semester in Berg's Great Works program, and some of them have chosen off that list, others have chosen uh, works of interest to themselves uh, that inevitably will appear on the Great Works list in some future semester. And I've noticed a, a theme that has emerged in the choices uh, this year, uh, so I'm going to call this year's program A Brief Journey Through Hell, um, and we're going to end with a stop in paradise, fortunately, um, uh, to end on a happier note. And our first speaker this evening, or this afternoon, excuse me, is uh, Alexander Heyman, known to most people as Sasha, uh, who, uh, like Yi Yan Li, one of the two speakers on this panel, who uh, has a biography similar to that of many Baruch students. Um, he grew up in, in another country, speaking another language, and now graces the English language with his talent, much to our benefit. Um, he's the author of The Lazarus Project, which was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award, and of three collections of short stories. The Question of Bruno, Nowhere Man, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Love and Obstacles, um, most recently, he completed a project that is very near and dear to my heart, um, which is a giant book of the best European fiction, um, 2010, published by the Dalkey Archive Press, which is an extraordinary survey of many, many European writers that many of us had never heard of before they were in this book, so we owe a great debt to Sasha for having brought them to our attention. Um, he was born in Sarajevo, uh, visited Chicago in 1992 uh, on what he thought would be a brief visit, and Sarajevo came under siege while he was there and he was unable to return home. Uh, he published his first story in English in 1995, three years later, was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2003, and a Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation in 2004. Please join me in welcoming Sasha Hayman. I will speak about and read from a book by Tadeusz Borowski, which is uh, published in English as This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen. His uh, biography is relevant in more ways than one, so let me just outline briefly. He was born in 1922 in Zhitomir, which is today in south uh, western Ukraine. It was back then in Soviet Ukraine to Polish parents. In 1926, his father was transported to the Ar arrested and transported to um, beyond the Arctic Circle to participate in, or not willingly, in digging the White Sea Canal. Uh, his father had participated in organizing Polish uh, forces in World War One, um, and essentially being part of the Polish independence movement. His mother was then sent to Siberia, to a different end of the Gulag uh, system. Uh, he was raised by an aunt. In 1932, his father was exchanged for some Polish, I mean, not necessarily Polish, but for some communist in Poland, and then uh, settled in Warsaw with Tadeusz, and his mother, Tadeusz's mother joined him two years later. In 1939, Poland was invaded both by the Nazis and then the Soviet Union, um, and uh, Tadeusz stayed in Warsaw, which was under the Nazi control. He was 17. In 1939. So, in the middle of his education, as it were, um, education and pub publishing anything was forbidden to Poles on the Nazi <coughs> occupation. Um, so, he studied in an underground school and was very interested in literature and he was writing poetry. He indeed published a book of poetry in 1942, where he predicted in classical cadenzas the extermination of mankind. A quote from the introduction by Jan Kott. Um, a few weeks later, he was arrested. He, uh, his fiancée, with whom he lived, did not return home, and he, he went to look for her. And um, she was entrapped, 
visiting uh, a friend and then asked to wait for her there and he fell into the same trap, was subsequently sent to Auschwitz. Um, in Auschwitz, there were several camps, in fact, there was not in a death camp being at all. Just a, a month or two before that, the Aryans, that is the non-Jews, were stopped being sent to the gas chambers, except for the ones who uh, were too weak to live. Uh, so he was relatively lucky. Um, he worked in a hospital after uh, contracting uh, typhoid and then stayed home in the hospital. He was then, when, um, in 1944, when Auschwitz was evacuated as the uh, Soviets were advancing in that direction, he would spend a year or so in Dachau, which was not a bad camp, but it was very, very bad. Um, then he wandered around Europe, largely trying to reconnect with his fiancée, who ended up in Sweden. She was also in Auschwitz, in the uh, women's camp. She ended up in Sweden, it took them a while to get together. He then returned to Poland in 1946 and um, became a communist, despite his father and his family experience. And spent a year in Berlin, uh, performing various missions. Some of them were uh, Frankenstein, shall we say. He came back to Poland after uh, year in Berlin as a communist communist and spent the last years of his life writing essentially propaganda, pro-communist propaganda, as um, some of his friends from before the war and end of the war were being arrested by the same government. In fact, a friend who who's, uh, was visited by his fiance and who he went to uh, look for after his fiance had never returned home was arrested and tortured by communists after he'd been tortured by the Nazis uh, in 1942. So in 1940, 1951, sorry, Tadej Wierowski, not yet 30, committed suicide. Uh, and it was a, a great hope of Polish literature. The stories that he had written in the mid 40s and late 40s are collected in English under the um, title This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before he went back to Poland, um, returning, repatriating Poland in 1946, some of his stories, a couple of stories were published, one of which was the eponymous story, The Swift of the Gas, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and he was already famous in Poland when he arrived in his uh, uh, mid 20s or even early 20s at that time. He was the great hope of the Polish literature, but then Polish literature in Poland would be the grip of the communists and the Soviet. Um, masses was tightening uh, in the late 40s, so he never quite uh, came off as murder and then committed suicide. I will read from the story this way for the gas, ladies and gentlemen, in this book. Um, in this story, the character of the name, name Kadosh is uh, witnessing and participating in unloading a transport in Auschwitz. This transport, which is loaded up trains full of uh, Jews who are being unloaded from the train uh, cars and then loaded up in um, trucks and taken directly to um, the gas chamber and then crematoria. crematoria. Um, he sort of was invited by a friend of his, a French communist named Henri, who is a member of the commando, the prisoners who helped the Nazis conduct this, not really, really but obviously, but they depend on those transports because this is where they get their food. Uh, and the Nazis allow them to take the food away from the people who are coming. This is the second transport in the road. They have road. And suddenly, about the teeming crowd, pushing forward like a river driven by an unseen power, a girl appears. She descends lightly from the train, hops on to the gravel, looks around inquiringly as if somewhat surprised. Her soft blonde hair has fallen on her shoulders in a torrent. She throws it back impatiently. With a natural gesture, she runs her hands down her blouse, casually straightens her skirt. She stands like this for an instant, gazing at the crowd, and then turns and with a gliding look examines our faces as though searching for someone. Unknowingly, I continue to stare at her until our eyes meet. Listen, tell me, where are they taking us? I look at her without saying a word. Here standing before me is a girl, a girl with enchanting blonde hair, with beautiful breasts, wearing a little cotton blouse, a girl with a wise, mature look in her eyes. Here she stands, gazing straight into my face, waiting. And over there is the gas chamber, communal death 
disgusting and ugly. And over in the other direction is the concentration camp. The shaved head, the heavy studded trousers and sultry heat, the sickening stale honor of dirty, damp female bodies, the animal hunger, the inhuman labor, and later the same gas chamber, only an even more hideous, more terrible death. Why did she bring it? I think to myself, noticing a lovely gold watch on her delicate wrist. He'll take it away from her, anyway. Listen, tell me, she repeats. I remain silent, her lips tighten. I know, she says with a shade of proud contempt in her voice, tossing her head. She walks off resolutely in the direction of the trucks. Someone tries to stop her. She boldly pushes him aside and runs up the steps. In the distance, I can only catch a glimpse of her blonde hair flying in the breeze. <clears throat> I go back inside the train. I carry out dead infants. I unload luggage. I touch corpses, but I cannot overcome the mounting, uncontrollable terror. I try to escape from the corpses, but they are everywhere, lined up on the gravel, on the cement, and edge of the ramp, inside the cattle cars, babies, hideous naked women, men twisted by convulsions. I run off as far as I can go, but immediately a whip slashes across my back. Out of the corner of my eye, I see an SS man swearing profusely. I stagger forward and run, lose myself in the Canada group. Now at last, I can once more rest again against the stack of rails. The sun has leaned low over the horizon and illuminates the ramp with reddish glow. The shadows of the trees have become elongated, ghost-like. In the silence that settles over nature at this time of day, the human cries seem to rise all the way to the sky. Only from this distance does one have a full view of the inferno on the teeming ramp. I see a pair of human beings who have fallen to the ground locked in a last desperate embrace. The man has dug his fingers into the woman's flesh and has caught her clothing with his teeth she screams hysterically, swears, cries, until at last a large boot comes down on over her throat, and she is silent. They are pulled apart and dragged like cattle to the truck. I see four Canada men lugging a corpse, a huge swollen female corpse. Cursing, dripping wet from the string, they kick out of their way some stray children who have been running all over the ramp, howling like dogs. The men pick them up by the collars, head arms, and toss them inside the trucks on top of the heaps. The four men have trouble lifting the fat corpse onto the car. They call others for help, and all together they hoist up the mound of meat. Big, swollen, puffed up corpses are being collected from all over the ramp. On top of them are piled the invalids, the smaller, the sick, the unconscious. The thief seat is, seat, sorry, piles, groans. The driver starts the motor. The truck begins rolling. Halt, halt! And as this man yells after them, stop, damn you. They're dragged into the truck, an old man wearing tails and a band around his arm. His head knocks against the gallop and pavement. He moans and wails in an uninterrupted monotone. I wish to speak with the commander. With senile stubbornness, he keeps repeating these words all the way. Thrown in the truck, trampled by others, choked, he still wails. I wish to speak. Look here, old man, a young SS man calls, laughing jovially. In half an hour, you'll be taking You'll be, you'll be talking with the top commandant. Only don't forget to greet him with a Heil Hitler. Several other men are carrying a small girl with only one leg. They hold her by the arms and the one leg. Tears are running down her face and she whispers, Baby, sir, it hurts, it hurts. They throw her on the truck on top of the corpses. She will burn alive along with them. The evening has come, cool and clear. The stars are out. We lie against the rails. It is incredibly quiet. Anemic bulbs hang from the top of the high flame posts. Beyond the circle of light stretches an, in, an impenetrable darkness. Just one step, and a man could bench forever. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yi Yan Li, um, who I've had the pleasure of inviting to a panel before. And, um, who is quite an extraordinary young woman. Uh, she, like Sasha, uh, was born elsewhere in Beijing, to be specific, and she came to the United States in 1996. I believe she started out her career as a math genius, <laughs> uh, which is an accurate description of many of her students as well, of course. And uh, she has subsequently branched out to a degree that uh, she was 
named by Granta, uh, the British literary magazine, as one of the best young American novelists under 35. Um, I think within about 10 years of her first arriving in the United States, uh, which is quite an extraordinary um, achievement. Um, she uh, is the author of The Vagrants and A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, and she was selected for a writing award. Her most recent collection of stories is called Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, and it will be published in September of 2010. Please join me in welcoming Yi Yan Lee. Hello, thank you, Esther. Thank you, Sasha, for that beautiful uh, presentation of a writer. I'm, I'm very happy to be here because, you know, as a writer, sometimes you get tired of talking about yourself. And I'm so happy that I can talk about someone I really, really love. And I noticed that uh, from Esther uh, sent me the, the syllabus this semester, and I noticed the Chinese writer Lu Xun was on the list. And a few years ago, when I first started, I, I would give a reading in a local library in San Francisco, and and, and this very old, this very kind gentleman, Chinese gentleman, asked me afterwards. Said uh, he said, you know, you realize. Lu Xun also started as a, you know, a, with a medical science degree, where he wanted to pursue a, a doctor's degree, and then he changed to writing. And he said, well, you know, you started in medicine too, and I really wanted you to become the next Lu Xun. And I said, I was very honest, I said, no, I don't want to become him. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, you know, I admire Lu Xun, and I just wrote a introduction to his collected stories just published in Pen by Penguin. But I have a huge problem with him, always, because, I mean, for one thing, we grew up in China memorizing his work from very early on. But my problem is not only about memorizing his work, it's how he presented himself as a writer to the country. He claimed himself as the savior of China and he wanted his stories, he wanted his fiction and nonfiction to be the best medicine for China. And that was a very, very ambitious role. I mean, it's an it's a ambition as a writer. But in the end, I think he sort of, that goal took over his career. So he did something terrible to this writer I absolutely love. His name is Shen Cong Wen. So, I'm going to, I just, I'm also very happy I claim myself finally to become a translator. I just translated a selection of Shen Tsongwan's letter and published in the public space, this literary magazine uh, based in Brooklyn. So I'm going to read you the intro, very short introduction of my introduction to Shen Tsongwan so you get a sense of his life. Great books are never abandoners. They don't betray us. They don't turn away from our candid admiration and criticism. They don't die. More often than not, my attachment does not extend to the creators. I do read biographies, the correspondence and diaries of certain writers, but they come secondarily, anecdotally. This, however, is not the case with Shen Tong Wen's letters. Family letters of Shen Tsong Wen was among the few Chinese books I brought with me when I came to the U.S. in 1996. Shen, who was considered one of the most important writers of his generation, had stopped writing in the prime of his career when communism took over China. And his letters, though inadequate, offered the only available glimpse of those stories he might have written. I first discovered Shen Tsong Wen in college in the early 90s, when his work was just beginning to be reissued in China. The impact of his work was beyond language. I remember reading his masterpiece, Border Town, and the agony I felt at the thought of his truncated career. It's those unwritten books that have driven, that have driven me to read and reread his letters as if they could offer some small compensation for a loss that I almost took to be personal. All the while, I'm aware that my obsession with his letters and his life story is unfair, that Shen himself has been transformed into a character who, like the people in his stories, 
was caught between his love, in his case, for his writing, and a fate intolerant of that passion. Shen Chongwen was born in 1902 in Phoenix, a small town in western Hunan. After leaving school at 14, he joined the army. His work started to appear in magazines in 1925, and over the next 20 years, he published widely stories, novels, essays. Many of them, I believe, are among the best work of the 20th century China. Like Chekhov, his favorite writer, Shen wrote about his characters, riverside prostitutes receiving passing boatmen, a mother and a daughter acting out a living in a mill, an old man in charge of a ferry bringing up a granddaughter born out of wedlock, and many others, peasants, soldiers, fishermen, landlords, army officers, with a love and a kindness that stood out in his time. It also exposed him to criticism from leftist writers for his disinterest in politics and lack of commitment to the class struggle of the time. Revelance is always a useful tool for lesser minds to attack true artists. I, when I wrote that line, I really had Lu Xun in my mind because he was one of the biggest critics of Shen Chongwen from the very beginning. He called Shen Chongwen a feminine writer, you know, a beggar for, you know, for, for rich people, you know, to rich people. And he called his writing catering the ruling class. And because Lu Xun was such a big uh, figure in Chinese literature, and his criticism pretty much just single-handedly sent Shen Chongwen to hell, even at the beginning. In 1949, when the Communist Party was about to take over China, Shen foresaw a nation that would have no place for his writing. After two failed suicide attempts, he gave up writing fiction and took a research position in a museum. Later, during the Cultural Revolution, he was demoted to become a toilet cleaner, and his possessions were confiscated and burned. His experience during those years was not much different from, of, from that of other artists and intellectuals of his generation. In 1966, Lao She, another literary master of the 20th century, drowned himself after being beaten by the Red Guards. The same year, Fu Lei, the translator of Balzac, Roman Rowan, and other French writers, swallowed poison in his apartment, and two hours later, after making sure he was dead, his wife hanged herself. What makes Shen's case special, at least to me, is that he chose to end his writing career, a suicide in itself. Family Letters of Shen Chongwen, which his wife, Zhang Zhaohe, selected and edited for publication in 1995, begins with their courtship and covers a marriage that lasted for over 50 years. Shen had fallen in love with Zhang when she was 18 and a student in a Shanghai college, where he was teaching. When Zhao turned down Shen's pursuit, the president of the college, Hu Shi, the most influential intellectual and a key figure of education and literary reform of the time, told her that Shen was a genius with the most promising career. Zhang was adamant in her, dis in her disinterest and who then wrote to Shen Chongwen, my feeling is that this girl won't be able to understand you or your love, and I worry you're falling in love with the wrong person. You ought to struggle to get yourself out of this love. Don't let that girl brag in the future that she once broke the heart of Shen Chongwen. <laughs> Shen, however, did not follow his mentor's advice. After four years and many letters quoting later, they married in 1933. Shen died in 1988, never having broken his silence as a fiction writer. So that gives you a, a big picture of Shen Songwen. And his stories are, most of his stories are set in Western Hunan, where he grew up. And he really, I think it was so important that he loved his characters. As you no, know, I think Jen, Writers of his generation often have the, the class struggle or the politics of China in mind. Well, he was probably a political writer of, the, of his generation.
And I'm very happy that I think uh, Harper Collins just uh, reissued Border Town last year, published last year, and translated by Jeffrey Kinkley. I just want to say a few words about his translator, who I happen to be communicating lately. And he's, he started to be interested in Shen Tongwen's work when he was a graduate student at Harvard in the 1970s. And once China opened its gate, uh, Jeffrey went to China to, to visit Shen Tongwen. And all their communication and interactions at the time were monitored. So he could not, he had to meet Shen Tongwen in this hotel called Friendship Hotel. And if you know Beijing, you know, in the early 80s and late 70s, that's one of the, that was one of the two hotels that allowed foreigners to stay. So Jeffrey said, you know, they had many talks in, you know, Friendship Hotel. I love that Friendship Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and they really did start a very, very precious friendship in the next 20 years. And Jeffrey went to China many times, and he translated a lot of Shen Tongwen's work. And he also wrote a biography called The Odyssey of Shen Tongwen. And if you're interested, you can check out those. I'm just going to just a little bit. I just, I'll just read it. You, you know, this is my translation, of course, not very good. But I just want you to hear him in his letters to his wife. Because in the end, after he gave up, read, he gave up writing, his major work were his, was his writing. So this is in 1938, and it was during World War II, and he was, uh, he was away, he was trying to run away from, he was a war refugee, refugee. It's not daybreak yet, and you can barely see the shape of the trees and mountains in the white fog. Somewhere a family has been carrying out a funeral ceremony. The gongs and drums went on all night monotonously, endlessly. They must be tired, the monks in the family, the guests in the hired help. In the wavering candlelight, they must have been relying on the drumming and singing and praying to keep themselves awake, while their eyes long for the first sound of the rooster, their minds wandering to the kitchen where in the steamers ate treasured porridge and the lotus pudding was waiting, steaming hot. The drumming must have sounded the same a thousand years ago, and the first thousand years had never changed. We are all up, waiting to set out. When we go down the mountain, we will have to walk past an alley where the brothels are. The dogs may wake up at our footsteps and bark, and the girls who have spent the night without customers will think we have just left the other girls' rooms. From there, we'll go to the main street, and the gate leading out of town will still be closed. Next to the gate, we'll see the tofu maker already grinding soybeans for the day. When we leave the town, we'll see the river, its water having never stopped flowing for anyone. If we leave later, we may see the young women who spend the night with travelers on boats coming back from across the river. The travelers are journeying on, the women are returning home. I've often, I've often seen this woman on the ferries, standing silently. What, co what occupies their minds, I do not know. Do they have feelings outside the things they have to do for a living? Do they have dreams? Which of her visitors treats her with gentleness, which betrays her feelings? Who bullies her and who cheats on her? What's in her past and what's in her future? Life is like this. Every one of these women is like an ocean, her depths and her breath beyond fathoming. It is said that in this small town, there are 500 young women who are in this business. If only they could write their own stories. That's Shen Tsongwen in the letter talking about the river prostitute. And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. journey is Mexico, um, uh, uh, just about the same time period too, I believe, still the middle of the 20th century, um, and uh, we will be taken there by Martin Solares, uh, a young Mexican fiction writer and critic, and um, publisher actually, who has recently become the literary director of Almadilla, a publishing house in Oaxaca. 
Um, he received the Efraín Huerta National Literary Award in 1998 for his short story, El Planeta Cloralex, very intriguingly titled. And his first novel, Los Minutos Negros, has just been translated into English as The Black Minutes. And uh, it was translated by Aura Estrada, a very beautiful late friend of both of ours. And the translation was completed by John Pluker. Um, and it's been shortlisted for the Romulo Gallegas International Novel Prize and published in German, as well as in the original Spanish and English. Um, and Martin will be assisted by Nancy Adler, who will be interpreting for him. Um, so this is Martin Estrada. <laughs> Nancy Adler Martin Solares. Um, hello, I will need um, a great amount of patience um, from that side of the table. Uh, as you know, the, literary, uh, the literature is made uh, by at least two uh, elements, the writer and the readers. But, uh, <coughs> We will need a second writer in English. Uh, I mean uh, Nancy, uh, um, next, next to me, to help me. Um, sí. Okay. Creo que um, voy a intentar hablar en español para eh, ser un poco más fluido y eh, tener un poco de reducir el nerviosismo. Sí, bueno. I will try to speak Spanish so that I can be more fluid and be a little less nervous. Como ustedes saben, en 1999, el periódico El País hizo una encuesta entre todos los críticos hispanoparlantes para tratar de determinar quién era el mejor escritor o quién había sido el mejor escritor en español del siglo XX. Todos los críticos eligieron a Juan Rubio. Como todos saben, en 1999, El País, the Spanish newspaper, had a survey to try and find out among the critics who had been the best uh, writer in Spanish of the 20th century. They, have, they all chose Juan Rulfo. Durante los últimos 60 años, eh, críticos en todas partes del mundo, entre ellos Susan Sontag o Jorge Luis Borges, han tratado de reconocer a Juan Rulfo como uno de los mayores escritores eh, modernos y de poner su nombre junto a los de Kafka, Faulkner, Proust o James Joyce. No. <laughs> okay, in the last 60 years, writers and critics such as Susan Sontag, Jorge Luis Borges, have tried to uh, put Rufo's name next to the greatest modern writers such as Kafka, Faulkner, Proust, and Joyce. Tan solo Gabriel García Márquez, el autor de Cien años de soledad, dijo que las obras completas de Juan Rulfo eh, apenas, apenas suman 300 páginas, pero son tantas, tan valiosas y tan perdurables como las que conocemos de Sofocles. And only Gar Gabriel García Márquez, who wrote A Hundred Years of Solitude, was able to say that even though Juan Rulfo, only his total works, is, uh, were only 300 pages long, they were so important, so um, uh, well written, so complete, that an everlasting as they were uh, similar to uh, uh, Sophocles. Pero qué tiene qué tiene de especial esta novela? Qué es tan especial? Bueno, que es algo más que una novela. En realidad es un gran hechizo verbal. Es un un uh, conjunto de palabras que funcionan como un mecanismo. En cuanto uno lee la primera frase está obligado o condenado a llegar hasta el punto final. Su vida va a cambiar a partir de ahí. So what is so great about Juan Rulfo and what is so great about his novel? Well, it's kind of like a verbal spell. Once you start reading it, it's a group of words, but once you start reading them, they become a spell, and now you are forced, or rather condemned, to go all the way in to the end. This novel starts with a mirage and it finishes with an hallucination. See, uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I need a second translator to the Spanish. Tan pronto empieza esta novela, um, el protagonista que trata de encontrar a, un, a su padre, eh, hay un, hay un um, 
La novela comienza cuando... Es que somos, la novela comienza cuando un joven, Juan Preciado, presencia cómo muere su madre. Ok, bueno. Well. As it starts, the main character tries to find... Let me start a little bit sooner. Juan Preciado, the main character, the novel begins when he witnesses the killing of his mother. Well, his mother dies uh, in front of his eyes and um, he travels to Comala. Comala is an imaginary village. Some, some people say that it's in the middle of Jalisco, but it isn't in Jalisco. There is no Comala in Jalisco. There is a village named Comala in Colima, another uh, part of the country. But uh, this character um, um, meets, the, the first person, person he meets in Comala is a phantom. The second, one, the second one is the phantom of a suicide woman. The third person that he finds is the phantom of a couple. No? And uh, every one of the, these uh, persons he met um, acts like some kind of vampire. Nobody accepts that, but every time that Juan Preciado, this uh, character, uh, meets one of these um, strange uh, dead people who doesn't want to hear that they are dead already, uh, Juan Preciado feels um, weaker and weaker and weaker. No? It's like he, he has all been attacked by a group of vampires. Finally, in the, uh, page uh, 49 uh, or so, uh, Juan Preciado dies suddenly. But Juan Preciado was telling the novel. But uh, in, in the page 49 of this novel, um, it uh, appears to occur a miracle. Huh? Uh, suddenly, we realize that all the novel has been the answer to a very sinister question that was formulated by another uh, dead woman. Imagine uh, that Juan Preciado uh, is, um, was dead from the beginning, and that the first phrase of the novel was the answer of a dead narrator to a second, uh, to a dead woman who taunts, uh, who fall, sorry, um, um, next to him, and who asks him, what are you doing he, uh, what are you doing in this grave? Hope to, did you arrive to this grave? And in that point, this novel, Pedro Paramo, starts. The first phrase of this novel to um, that I'd like to share. Uh, I'd like to share now the spell with you. And so the first phrase is I came to Comala because I had been told that my father, a man named Pedro Paramo, lived there. It was my mother who told me, and I had promise, promised her that after she died, I would go see him. I squeezed her hands as a sign I would do it. She was near dead, and I would have promised her anything. Don't fail to go see him, she had insisted. Some called him one thing, some another. I'm sure he will want to know you. At the time, all I could do was to tell her I would do what she asked, and from promising so often, I kept repeating the promise, even after I had put my hands free of her dead grip. What about that phrase? En Comala, voy a continuar en español, las almas, cada personaje tiene una voz, un cuerpo y un alma. En Comala, each of the characters has a voice, a body, and a soul. Una de las cosas más impresionantes de esta novela es que las almas de los personajes se pasean por ahí y a veces tienen un gran rencor contra el cuerpo hacia el cual pertenecieron. One of the, uh, I guess, distinctive features of this novel is that um, the souls that are wandering around this, uh, this place have a bit of a resentment towards the body that belongs to them. Una segunda gran característica de esta novela es su inmenso monumental humor negro. Another uh, specific feature of this novel is that it's a black humor. A, a cosmic uh, black humor, because it seems like if it's like if the universe had decided to love of the first uh, characters every time he falls in disgrace. Um, 
En esta novela, además, la búsqueda del padre, que es un tema eh, muy, muy eh, frecuente en las novelas, se vuelve trágicamente el asesinato del padre. In this novel, the search of the father, which is a very common theme in a lot of novels, becomes tragically the death of the father. Rufo imaginaba a un hombre a punto de morir y a una mujer muerta. Rufo was, Rufo was imagining a man uh, about to die and a woman already dead. Eh, y esta mujer muerta hablaba con otros difuntos. And the dead woman was talking to other dead people. La novela fue pulida durante varios años. Originalmente se llamó primero Los Desiertos de la Tierra. The novel was revised over the year and the first title was The Deserts of Earth. Eh, el segundo fue Una Estrella Junto a la Luna y el tercero Los Murmullos. El cuarto finalmente, el que ustedes conocen, Pedro Palma. The second was A Star Next to a star next to the moon. The third act title was Whispers, and the fourth one, fourth one, the one you know, uh, Pedro Páramo. Una de las cosas más simpáticas es que esta fabulosa novela de fantasmas que funciona como un mecanismo perfecto se estructuró sobre una mesa de ping pong. And one of the uh, most fun things about this novel is that this ghost story, this ghost, the story about ghosts, actually came to be in front of a ping pong table. Aparentemente Juan Rulfo eh, vivía junto a la casa de Juan José Arreola. Juan Rulfo apparently lived next to José Arreola. Yeah, another writer. Y eh, Juan Rulfo, eh, cuando en eh, la noche que eh, tenía que terminar la novela para cobrar una beca, eh, no sabía cómo estructurar su libro. Así que bajó a ver a su mejor amigo y mientras jugaban un partido de ping pong, desplegaron los 69 fragmentos de la novela sobre la mesa. Y fue como esta novela encontró su forma. So, in order, eh, Juan Rulfo, that last night, wanted to find the structure for his novel. And he couldn't find it, but he needed this in order to get his grant and, and you know, move on. So, he went to visit his, his friend and they started playing ping pong. But they put all 69 fragments of the novel on the table while playing. This is how he found his structure. And, <laughs> Yo creo que eso explica fehacientemente por qué esta novela es tan veloz. And I think that really explains why, why this novel is so, so fast, uh, it's such fast reading. Eh, eh, está saltando siempre de los vivos a los muertos. A cada... Just always from dead to people that are alive, from the dead to the living. Sí. Y eh, Octavio Paz, el eh, premio Nobel mexicano, decía que eh, esa novela eh, no nos ofrece una imagen conocida de este mundo que habitamos sino que nos ofrece una visión de otro mundo, un mundo desconocido. And Octavio Paz, the Mexican Nobel Prize uh, laureate, used to say about this novel that the novel does not show us, it doesn't offer us a vision of the world we live in, but rather a vision of an unknown world. Y es que eh, en realidad creo que esta es una de las mayores ficciones que se han escrito en español. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque Rufo, con una gran inteligencia, nos lleva a una dimensión insospechada. And I think this is one of the greatest works of fiction in, uh, written in Spanish. I think that Rulfo was very intelligently takes us to another dimension we never knew existed. En esa dimensión, Rulfo nos cuenta que los, eh, que los muertos se molestan cuando llueve demasiado. In this dimension and in this world, Rulfo tells us Dead people get really upset if it rains too much. <laughs> Because they're coughing, they, they make noise. <laughs> And at that moment, they don't care about their names anymore. Pero, sin embargo, les gusta evocar y contar los relatos de sus vidas o de las que fueron sus vidas. But they, look, they like to remember and uh, relate. <coughs> the story of what their lives used to be. Esto es exactamente lo mismo que ocurre en las mejores páginas de escritores tan diversos eh, como Ambrose Beers, Homero o Dante. Um, to, to tell life, their, their so-called life before, and uh, they're in the best pages, you, will, you can see that uh, it can be uh, related, similar to the greatest writers such as Homero, Dante, or Ambrose Pierce. Y, Amber, excuse me. 
sí, la, 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 sí, bueno, son ambos virgen, es que todo lo que hacen, ¿no? de, de, de terror tiene, ¿no? De, ya, de, yo, yo, yo todavía no consigo. Bueno, con eso Juan Rolfo nos demuestra que la novela es mucho más que simple entretenimiento. Es la creación de un mundo alternativo. And like this, Rufo shows us that the novel is a lot more than just uh, reading for fun and entertainment. It shows us a, a world, an alternative view of the world. Y nos demuestra que la gran literatura es capaz de transformar a los lectores. Al empezar una novela, entramos como Dr. Jekyll por la puerta de adelante y salimos como Mr. Hyde por la puerta de atrás. And he shows us that a novel is a great work. I'm sorry. Yes, a great novel also uh, causes a transformation in the reader. We come in through the front door as Dr. Jekyll and get out the back door as Mr. Hyde. Y finalmente, eh, con, este, con este gran libro, Pedro Páramo, eh, Juan Rulfo nos demuestra que la novela no está muerta. And uh, Juan Rulfo shows us in this great book, Pedro Páramo, that the novel is not dead. Que, si no la leemos, nos estamos perdiendo una de las experiencias más ricas e intensas de la vida. Muchas gracias. Y si no lo leemos, estamos perdiendo una de las experiencias más enriquecidas y mejores experiencias en la vida. Muchas gracias. Gracias a usted. ¿Quién sabía que había ping-pong tables en la casa? Nuestro siguiente speaker es um, uh, de Holland, Marcel Murray. Uh, he, who published his first novel in 1990. Uh, his second novel won the AKO Prize, which is the Dutch equivalent of the Booker Prize in English. And um, his third book was a novella called Decay is the Way of All Flesh. Uh, in 1998, 1998, he published the novel In Babylon, which was one of his earliest books to be translated into English, or there had been others before that, or in Babylon was the, oh, there had been others as well. So there are many books by Marcel Moring in English. Um, and in Babylon won two Golden Owls and a Flemish award for the best, best Dutch Flemish book of 1998. Um, his most recent novel has just come out in English, or is coming out in just a couple of months, or it's already out. It's just out right now. It was translated from the Dutch by Sean Whiteside, and it's called In a Dark Wood, um, which is a phrase that might be familiar to some of you and give you a clue as to which classic writer Marcel Murray will be talking about today. Um, so welcome, Marcel Murray. Thank you. Any ideas who I've been talking about? <laughs> Shall we have a little context? Yes, Dante, yeah, it is. Or Dante Alighieri, um, as his full name is. Um, a 13th, 14th century Italian writer, the first Italian writer to write actually in Italian, um, uh, in popular language, not in Latin. Um, he lived in Florence, he was forced to leave Florence uh, due to a political upheaval. As he supported the wrong party and had to spend the rest of his life outside of Florence, ever always longing for his native Florence and dying in exile. This, the book I want to talk about is a three-part book. It's a poem, actually. It's a three-part poem. Um, a Divina Commedia, the, the, the Divine Comedy. Three parts, Hell, Purgatory, and Paradise. Hell, of course, is the most interesting part. And um, I don't want to talk about hell, in fair enough. It, um, the thing is, if you, if you start reading Dante's Inferno, um, you, you will also read about Dante's um, obsession with his political rivals and the people who, who crossed his path and um, the people with whom he had to settle a few, a few scores. The Inferno is packed to the brim with um, uh, Dante's enemies. Of course, a lot of, a lot of popes that, that, that were Solomites or, or had wives, or, um, well, that's, that's a modern story really, isn't it? Um, the Catholic <laughs> Church, uh, whatever, um, adultery, the common sins of his day and age. 
Um, and Dante, Dante had obviously had a very clear uh, view of what, what was sinful. What was sinful was what the Catholic Church uh, thought was sinful. So Dante's hell in the inferno, the nine rings of the hell that he described, is the kind of hell where you will find um, Catholic dogmas turned into persons. But the persons are persons that crossed Dante's path with whom he had to settle the score. Um, but as a, another story behind the defined comedy, it was once uh, um, uh, described, I think, in the New York Review of Books, and um, the short description I've ever read about the defined comedy as some woman put Dante through hell. <laughs> so it's really, and that's true, he, 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 he goes through his ordeal, he goes through hell, purgatory, and finally up to paradise. Um, just to see his um, childhood love, Beatrice. And he gets to see her in paradise, and after a long journey, his guide during the first part of the journey through Inferno is Virgil, the classical writer, who um, Dante sadly um, uh, has to um, admit won't have, uh, uh, be able to gain a place in, 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 in heaven because Virgil obviously wasn't uh, baptized. He was a classical writer before Christianity. So if you if you um, you were born before Christ, life sucked after death. <laughs> um, what's wonderful about Dante's Inferno is is not that it's it's well it's of course one of Europe's classics. There are there are an endless number of books that that, that are based on Dante's Inferno. And this, my book, won't be the last one. I use Dante's Inferno as a topographical template for my book. Um, but a number of, any number of books are based on Dante's Inferno. He's, he's George's hero, he's Beckett's hero, he's my hero, and he's everybody's hero. Everybody who wants to be a writer should read Dante and should read the Inferno. What was wonderful about the Inferno is that you could pull it apart like a clock and still admire the clockwork. I once had to do a reading about Dante's Inferno, and I never got, got past the first two sentences. And after two hours, they sent me home. <laughs> the first two sentences of the first sentence being, Nel mezzo del cammini nostra vita mi ritrovai per un selva oscura. Halfway through my life, I'm ad-libbing this in English, uh, I found myself in a dark wood. Uh, that's the title of my book, by the way, In a Dark Wood, published by Harper Collins, available in the lobby. <laughs> um, but this first sentence is such a complete sentence. This is the first evidence we have, literally, archaeologically speaking, of what we call in media, it's a book that starts in the middle of a of story. Um, Dante finds himself in a dark wood and at the, at, at the same time, he, he, he finds himself halfway his life. So halfway his life is 35 in when the 14th century starts. Halfway his life is the life expectancy in his day and age. Well, not really. It's an Old Testament life expectancy, but Dante is an Old Testament guy. And so halfway through his life, he is in a dark wood. And this gives us the first clue about the Inferno, because the Inferno is not really, not only the first book to start with um, in media as in the middle of the story, it's also the first book, it's also the first postmodern book. And modernism wasn't even invented. It's a postmodern book because Dante is not only the writer, he's obviously also the actor of the book. The book is about a person called Dante Alighieri who haphazardly um, goes into hell by accident, forced by wild animals, meets virtue, travels through hell, through purgatory, and to paradise. And as a reader, you're aware of the fact that this is astounding. The year is 19, uh, 1321, that's when he finished uh, his defined company. The year is 1321, and here is an author, a poet, who writes a text 
in which he not only pictures hell, purgatory, and heaven, paradise, but also places himself as an actor in this, well, obviously to the 14th century reader, not fictive landscape, but to this fictive landscape. It's, that's a revolutionary thing to do, even in this day and age, but let alone in this day. So it's a vibrant, vital work. It's, even in this day, it's a very modern work. If you read um, The Inferno, you read what literature can do and has done during the past, what is it, six, seven centuries. So I decided, um, modest as I am, to use Dante for my own purposes. Um, in 1980, I was with a, with a friend of mine who was a photographer, and he had to, um, his job was to um, shift pictures during one night in, in we grew up in a very small town in the north of the Netherlands. I'm going to tell you what time town it was, so you'll never forget it. Uh, it's called Assen. 40,000 inhabitants in 1980. Um, and then annually there are motor races. And during the motor races, they last for a week, um, the town triples or even quadruples in size. And um, the visitors are you know, the kind of kind of people who drive bikes. Yes. They're not really art lovers. So it's a very rough atmosphere. And we had we had to we had to, to do one night this photographer and friend of mine and, and, and I I was his bodyguard and um, had to carry his bags and so forth. And I thought this is a great backdrop for a novel. I wasn't even a writer then so and um, and this this is really when I started thinking about Dante because I had a real read a little bit of Dante at school, and, uh, and I thought, well, as a way, as a preparation, I should read The Inferno by Dante. And I started reading it in English, because there's, there's a wonderful translation in English by Charles Sinclair in the Bollington series, published by Harvard University Press. And actually, it's a bilingual edition. It's six books, Inferno, Purgatory, Paradise, and three uh, uh, commentaries on so I started reading in English, and then I thought, well, I, the thing to do really with Dante is to read him in Italian too. So what Charles Sinclair, um, Charles Sinclair gave, gave, gave me a chance by uh, doing an excellent translation to learn Italian, because I, I started reading Dante in Italian, and when I, whenever I couldn't comprehend the Italian, I looked up the English, and. Lo and behold, after two months, I was able to read Italian. And still to this day and age, I read an Italian newspaper, but I can't order a meal in an Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so this is 1980, and then um, uh, I kept rereading Dante and, and, and um, decided that this should be a novel. And I had, to, I had to write two or three other novels before I really felt able to, to use Dante and to, uh, uh, and to give him on her. And, um, and finally, in 1998, I started writing uh, In a Dark Wood, which is my uh, uh, Dante homage. This is about a Jew in a small town in the north of the Netherlands. I'm Jewish myself, so I turned Dante's Catholics into Jews in the north of the Netherlands. Um, this is about a Jew who went into hiding in 1940, um, literally in a, in a hole in the ground emerges after four or five years and then decides to take over the town. Um, the book starts when he's when he has just died, just died. He's sixty, he's died, and this is this one night it's it's a book about one night, one night during the motor races festivals. During one night he walks through his town, the town where he grew up and where he lived, where he was in hiding during the war, and it turned out to be a hell for him. So this is Dante's hell. <coughs> Um, as told by a Dutch Jew in the north of the Netherlands. So I would like to close this um, um, self-promotion and Dante promotion, of course, <laughs> by advising you to read Dante, uh, if only as a, uh, as a preparation to read. <laughs> I'm 
And um, now on this gorgeous glittering day, it's time for a bit of glittering Caribbean paradise uh, from Major Jackson, uh, who may be the best known of our writers to many of you here because uh, we have the great privilege of having him here at Baruch this semester as the Sydney Harmon Writer in Residence. Um, and it's a privilege indeed. Uh, he's also the only poet among the novelists, actually, our, our paradise man. So uh, you can draw your own conclusions about that. Um, uh, he's the author of Hoops and Leaving Saturn, two poetry collections, the latter of which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. And his new book, Holding Company, is forthcoming in August, right, uh, from W.W. W. Norton. And uh, he's the poetry editor of the Harvard Review. And when he's not teaching at Baruch, he lives in Vermont. Welcome. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to talk about my assignment, uh, the poet uh, Derek Walcott, who is very much alive, so alive that uh, the New York Times Book Review ran a, in, ran a review of his latest collection, White Egrets, uh, this past Sunday. Um, I, I was very happy to, to um, been asked to join this panel because um, when I got the list to see what authors we could talk about, I guess the list the authors that are on this syllabus, I was very happy to see Derek Walcott's name. Primarily because it, it would allow me to head off the critics and their assertion that I owe him a great debt as a writer. I can I can claim him and say yes, indeed. Um, if uh, if I'm so privileged for that to happen, um, Derek Walcott. Um, if you heard, uh, this is supposed to be a, a classic class and. Um, when the list came over, it was just his name that was listed. But I imagine that students are reading his great reworking of Homer, um, Omeros. Uh, so I just took the liberty of, all, all those Omeros was very, very important to me. Um, I took the liberty of concentrating mainly on um, his books from 19, uh, the 1990s forward. He was born in uh, St. Lucia in 1930 to um, uh, Warwick, uh, who was an aspiring poet and painter, and a civil worker, and Alex, who was a teacher. Uh, he studied at the University of West Indies. Um, he uh, uh, ran a theater in Trinidad uh, for a number of years, called the Trinidad and uh, Trinidad theater workshop. Um, he eventually uh, left the Caribbean or the West Indies and moved to the States where he has kind of lived back and forth between uh, St. Lucia and Boston and uh, of late in the past 10 years in New York. Um, he published his first book of poems, 25 poems, when he was 18 years old. Uh, in 1948. Uh, he's went on to publish many books of poetry um, and many plays. Um, and it also should be stated, although he's quite harsh on himself, uh, that he's a, actually an excellent, uh, excellent painter. Um, he was awarded the MacArthur uh, Genius Award and the Nobel Prize in 1992. Um, Omeros was published in uh, 1990, and uh, that particular book uh, revealed to the world um, Derek Walcott's great powers, um, which were his ability to synthesize uh, his influences um, without any self-consciousness, um, from Homer to Borges um, to uh, John Clare uh, to a number of British authors, British poets, including Auden and uh, Milton, there's something Miltonic about his verse. Um, the West Indies, one of the great controversies uh, that he took up um, among uh, other writers 
was this idea that uh, the West Indies had not much to offer as a um, as a as a not much to offer in terms of literature and art because it, it was an amalgamation of many different uh, cultures and, and countries that had come to possess and own that particular area. So this has become his particular project, and this is where he probably most has the greatest uh, influence on me and many other writers, um, which is, um, although we are a polyglot of cultures, particularly here uh, in the US with our various uh, ethnic and cultural inheritances, the job of the writer, the job of the artist, is to weave that in into a particular uh, whole. Walcott, however, um, for me, his influence goes beyond this kind of grand uh, project. Um, if, you, if you are a writer, um, not only do you aspire to be a writer, not only do you read uh, Joyce, not only do you read uh, Dante, um, but you also read as someone who has a particular kind of uh, hunger, um, almost a parasitical hunger to acquire the magic uh, that is enacted in the works that you most admire. Walcott, as a teacher, definitely taught uh, Eliot's notion of, of being a, a, an individual talent who is who has a particular historical sense, a particular awareness of the great works that had come before, and that one's originality is born out of, out of an absorption of those great works. Um, it was difficult for me uh, to ignore Walcott, particularly after Robert Gray's famous endorsement, which was, he said this, Walcott handles English with the closer understanding of its inner magic than most of his English-born contemporaries. Salman Rushdie says, the greatest living English language poet, Walcott, erudite, incantatory, precise, blending Caribbean, classical, and American rhythms into a music all his own. His particular influence on me, I had to write this down, comes in three particular areas. In my reading of Derek Walcott, the sentence, and everyone knows the sentence for any writer is the canvas. The sentence is a moment of composition that goes beyond music. It's a kind of personal lyricism, but something that approaches a prayer. If you read Walcott, you realize, and particularly if you read him out loud, that there is this, to use the word that's already been said, this kind of incantation that happens as a result of his ability to modulate rhythms inside of a sentence. There's this kind of joy in the process of writing a line or writing uh, an utterance. Um, my particular generation, uh, with all of its admiration for uh, the postmodern writers and the postmodern philosophers, has put a great deal of emphasis on uh, the fragment, but also on free association as a means by which to um, penetrate the unconscious. Um, Derek Walcott, however, has a has a, a more disciplined way of revealing the world and its unearthing its connections. In Derek Walcott's, there is this lush matrix of figurative language that reveals a natural ordering that makes an aesthetic of fragmentation seem adolescent. For me, a lot of writers are overly inventive in their layering of their uh, influences and their um, and their, in their desire to uh, free associate towards some sort of whole. With Derek Walcott, he put so much emphasis, it's almost, again, this kind of joy in finding the right metaphor and finding the right simile. And this is where I believe most writers announce their individuality, their ability to make those connections, not just in the manipulation of language, 
not just in the rhythms that they employ in their sentences, but how they're able to compare one thing to, a, to the next in this wonderful composition that reveals something that is at once familiar but also um, new. Lastly, my, I had the opportunity of uh, hosting Derek Walcott in Philadelphia, where I'm from, and, and I paired him up with another poet that I admire, a poet that he had never met uh, or heard. And there was some time after the reading before the dinner that evening for us to sit down and have drinks and to dis discuss whatever uh, came up. And he was very enamored of this particular poet. And he said, and I'll never forget it, he said, um, my God, that man is at the center of language. And that's one of the highest praise that any writer can give to another writer, which is to talk about their relationship to language. And at first, I did not fully grasp what he meant um, by that. But later, when I had had an opportunity to contemplate, contemplate it, particularly contemplate where this was coming from, who was uttering this. This was someone who takes joy in rhyme. This is someone who takes joy in the sounds and texture of language himself. So for him, to rhyme is not just for the mere sake of rhyming. As he says in an interview, it's a kind of prayer. It's a kind of hands coming together. To be able to make a rhyme is kind of doing this. And in doing this, there is this other level, this almost spiritual level that one enters into when one writes formally, we call it, um, here in the States. This becomes a license for me, particularly in this day and age of free verse, in this day and age of, of experimentalism, to return to something that I think is utterly crucial for a poet, which is to enter into language and find those analogies, or find those analogs, I should say, that um, bespeak our reality, and that comes close to prayer. I'm going to read uh, two poems, one from uh, Derek Walcott's book, Midsummer, uh, which is, uh, th th these books have, have seen Walcott working in long sequences. This is from a sequence called uh, Tropic Zones, number eight. If you were here in this white room, in this hotel whose hinges stay hot, even in the wind off the sea, you would sprawl, knocked out by La Hora de Siesta. You couldn't rise for the resurrection bell or the sea's gong ringing with silver. You'd stay down. If you were touched, You'd only change that gesture to a runner's in that sonambulous marathon, and I'd let you sleep. Things topple gradually when the alarm clock with its conductor's baton begins at one. The cattle fold their knees in the quiet pastures. Only a mare's tail switches, feather dusting flies, drunk melons roll into ditches, and gnats keep spiraling to their paradise. Down the first gardener, under the tree of knowledge, forgets that he's Adam. In the ribbed air, each patch of shade dilates like an oasis to the tired butterfly, a green lagoon for anchor. Down the white beach, calm as a forehead that has felt the wind, a sacramental stasis would bring you sleep, which is midsummer's crown. Sleep that divides its lovers without rancor, sweat without sin, the furnace without fire, calm without self, the dying with no fear, as afternoon removes those window bars that strike your sleep like a kitten's or a prisoner's. This next poem is from his um, latest book, White Egrets. And it's a section from the Acacia Trees. Number two, boss man, if you look in those bushes there, you'll find a whole set of passport, wallet, ID, credit card. 
that is no use to them is money on their mind and it's not every time you'll find them afterwards. You just leave your bag with these things on the sand and faster than wind they jump out of the bush while you there swimming and rubbing tanning lotion. And when you find out it is no good to send a special unit, they done reach Masad. And, but I, not in that, not me, I just make a local change selling and blowing conch shells. It's sad but true, them faster than any vehicle, and I self never get in any commotion except with the waves, and soon all that will be lost. It's too much tourist and too little employment. How about a little life there? Thanks, but boss, don't let what I say spoil your enjoyment. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for two or three questions, and I actually have a question of my own um, that I'd like to start out with uh, for Sasha Heyman. Um, I'm just uh, curious to hear uh, you say a word or two about uh, the, the, the relationship between your own work and, and Borowski, or you know, the, the connection that was established there. Well, I don't know if there's a direct connection here, except for the fact that it's rather common in this year with here there's an excess of history. His biography, which I outlined, you know, all these things happened to him before he was 29. If he had lived beyond 1951, then so many more things would have happened. I was thinking about Borowski um, and other things, you know, thinking about other things. Um, and I realized that in Slavic languages, including uh, my native language, there's no translation of the word fiction. There's no distinction in the language between fiction and non-fiction. This is, as far as I know, entirely Anglo-Saxon thing or English language thing. Uh, to write about history, you don't need to segregate between fiction and non-fiction. Uh, Borowski's stories were published in what we would call here today um, in the form of fiction. But they're obviously not fiction because the axis of history and the experience that comes with it um, elevates uh, what would be a mere genre of form to an entirely different uh, level of, of perception. So literature operates on an entirely different level. It is simultaneously being witness, but it's also constructing experiences that could be passed on in the chaos, chaos of history. And to me, that is, uh, it is not only attributable to Borowski, but Borowski is one of the, the best examples um, that I can think of. His particular position or life stories, uh, his experience in Auschwitz is complicated and relevant not only because he was very witness, but because he was both a perpetrator and a, and a victim. And um, in the Holocaust and many mass crimes, it is easy to distinguish between the perpetrators and the, those who have died, the victims. But those who have survived have to have survived uh, by spending some of their moral credit. They want others die, and they didn't die. Uh, and so as not to die, they have to have committed something that is would not be entirely uh, acceptable to us living in this in a moral heaven. Uh, and he is perfectly capable of talking about it. He is perfectly capable of talking about it in first person. The mayor in this story and the other story is named Pavic. He takes full responsibility for what he's talking about which might or might not be fictional. Uh, he said something along the lines of, um, you cannot talk about Auschwitz in person. It is impossible to write about Auschwitz in person. Uh, and it is impossible to write about history for me in person. There's no history but person. Any other questions for the other writers?
I agree with you about your point of view about Shen Chongnan and Xun. So uh, it's very interesting to hear what you say. Um, I also read your book, Vigrun, just actually last week or whatever, just by chance. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if my question related to this conference, but my question is, um, because you come from China, I don't know if you ever uh, read uh, Chinese novel or fiction. Um, if you feel when you're writing, uh, do you feel the language it, it could become a problem, or um, if you compromise your style, you know, in language and all that, because maybe you cannot really say or write what you really want in a second language, things like that. You know, I well, English actually is my first language in writing. No, English is not my first language, but I've never written in Chinese. And in a way, I think even when I started writing, I made the dis well, either I made the decision or some decision was made for me by some thing I don't understand. I just, I could never write in Chinese, but I can, I can write in English. So I don't know if it's that psychological or it's just, it's just by nature, I feel, rather distanced from my mother tongue, <laughs> that it helps my mother doesn't read in English. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone else? Well, why don't you come up and speak into the mic? I can speak loud. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, as someone who teach, um, as someone who doesn't change the syllabus too much, <laughs> I'm constantly revisiting the masters and visiting the writers who I feel not only that my students should know, but I can continually steal something from them. So I'm kind of cheat cheating in a sense. Um, teaching allows me uh, to discover what I hadn't discovered before about those writers, which as we know, um, is the joy uh, in reading the classics, for sure. Um, schedule is a very important word for me. The first thing I try to do in the morning is to um, extend my hand and to grab the book that I had uh, beside me to read uh, two or three or 30 or 50 or 100 pages. And after that, uh, I start to write. I try, every day I try to write uh, at least one hour and a half. If I can write uh, even half an hour, one hour, or two hours in the best days of my life. <laughs> the rest of the day, uh, a pyramid can fall este, to me, and I'm very, very happy with the world because I had read and I had written something and I had uh, accomplished uh, my vocation. I just add something on that. I, I, I just I did an experiment last summer without doing the internet. And I highly recommend that. So, um, I started by doing internet, like I limit my internet time 30 minutes a day, and I then reduced it to 15 minutes a day. That included all my business emails. And I reread a lot of Tolstoy, I reread Middle March, I reread Dr. Chivago, all in one summer, plus like two straight volumes of collected stories. So that's, yeah. Oceans of time without internet. <laughs> this is a question for uh, Mr. Morin. Um, in writing your version of the Inferno, did you find that in transposing the story from the Catholic to the Jewish, from uh, medieval to modern ancient age, uh, to, uh, to modern or contemporary, do you find that your view of some aspects of the original classic changed? Because as you're writing, uh, you obviously made some decisions 
about things you want to keep or not keep or I mean, were there things that you found refreshed as you rewrote? Yes, it did actually, but, but mostly on a moral ethical plane. I had to decide, of course, um, what to do with Dante's um, um, take on sin and um, punishability. And I decided that his view on, um, well, sin, it's, it's all about sin, of course, um, couldn't be transported to the 21st century. And it shouldn't be transported to the 21st century because it's, it's a dogmatical, religious take on what's right and what's wrong. So I started thinking about well, what, would, what would be the kind of people that I would like to see in hell or... <laughs> and then I forgot the answer to the question because that would have been a different book. Or the kind of people that end up in hell. And that's the... And the question is my answer, really, because I, I don't think that people, there's no hell, of course, but I don't think that hell is a people, is, is a place where you, um, where you get when, you, when you've done, some, done something wrong. I wish it were true. It's a place um, where you end up, if you're born on the wrong t in, in, in the wrong place, on the wrong time, um, under the wrong circumstances. So you could, be, um, you could be gay in the 1950s and life is hell. You could be, you could be a, a German Jew in the 1930s and it's hell. You could be um, a, a woman in um, Victorian England and life is hell. Hell is the others, as, as Sartre would say. So I decided to turn Dante's religious, uh, moral, ethical take on hell into a more uh, social, political take on hell. And that's changed my view of his book. And not the greatness, literary greatness of his book, but um, the philosophical greatness of his book. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed all your presentations. And I have one very specific question and then a broader one. Um, Major Jackson, who, I want to know who the poet was that you paired with Derek Walcott. Yeah. And for the rest of you, if any of you had difficulty deciding which writer to pick, I'd be really curious to hear what your runners up were. Who were the, set, the people you would have also talked about if you'd have been able to talk about two? Well, I was tempted to pick Dante too, but um, <laughs> I had just taught. Um, I'm sorry, I just. No, please, please. Um, I had just taught uh, Tadej Borowski. So well, I I was going to talk about William Trevor, who's not on the list, but, but I talk about William Trevor all the time that I feel that I should give somebody else an <laughs> <laughs> um, I had I had my other option was Wordsworth, which would have been actually equally uh, relevant to talk about. Um, I think I do think American Romanticism is alive and well in the twenty first century. Um, uh, the other poet that I paired him up with was uh, Yusef Kamiyaka. Thank you. I would have loved to talk about a Dutch writer who is completely unknown in the United States, Gerard Kroll. He's not even translated. So I um, had a couple of difficulties talking about him. <laughs> but he's, a, he's a very important writer for um, most Dutch writers, a writer's writer, um, an early modernist, and a um, um, fascinating writer, I think, uh, but alas, not translated. All right, can, you, can you spell it? Can you spell it? I can spell it, but it won't, won't do you any good. <laughs> the name is Gerrit, G-E-R-R-I-T. His surname is Kroll, K R O L. Okay. Well, I will, um, my first intention was to talk about the Iliad because I have reread that book uh, during several. Uh, times in, in, in my life I've loved the way the gods speak with the humans uh, through another human. No? I love that the, the 
In fact, I tried to uh, copy that uh, technique uh, in my novel. But my novel is a pop novel, or, or, or is a novel about two Mexican cops in the Gulf of Mexico. But I realized that among your selection, there were uh, there, there um, wasn't uh, a Hispanic writer, and I think that uh, it was very very important to include a Hispanic writer. So I think Jorge Luis Borges and Roberto Bolaño in Manish uh, Bueno, uh, we are going to start with uh, the most popular uh, among the critics, uh, Juan Rolfo, because when I live in Paris, I uh, find uh, um, a print of, of the manuscripts of Juan Rolfo, of his famous novel, Pedro Parma. So during one year, I uh, did invite several uh, Hispan American, Spanish, Argentinian, uh, even Peruvian writers who were in, at, in Paris, and we did compare the final version of Pedro Parma to, uh, to the first version. And it was like a, a scene, if we were seeing the birth of a great, great career, no? because we could, uh, we, we, we could uh, see we were able to uh, decipher uh, how, how uh, Juan Rolfo became a great writer because her first version was very nice, was okay, but he decided to choose the only the best word for every phrase. And uh, he was a master of edition. He got and got and got. No? The, the final paragraph has two pages. He only um, um, published three phrases. And so uh, that, that's why he, he uh, created this great concept. And he just uh, acts like a verbal 